Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk, where actually we don't talk about movies, we talk about relationship advice, <laughs> right? That's right. That's right. Also, here is Christian Harloff. Finally, Darth Harloff has come back to the Schmodown. You're going down, Signora. I cannot wait for today. I am itching, you hump. Oh, I just got a little scared there. <laughs> also here is Perry Nemiroff. Oh, I feel you. If you need some couples therapy advice, you go to that guy right there. That's right. He's got it all. That's right. Um, guys, before we get started, I want to remind you about our Comic-Con contest that is going on our website, Collider.com. This is the contest where you can win a trip for two to San Diego Comic-Con this year in July. That's airfare, hotel, and some spending money. You can check out our YouTube description uh, for the link. It ends at the end of June, and it's for continental US residents only. So reminder, check that out so you can win. All right, we know a lot about the Alien Covenant cast, which includes Michael Fassbender, Catherine Waterston, Billy Crudup, and Danny McBride. However, we don't have much to go on in regards to story and characters, other than it's about the ship, Covenant, discovering an uncharted paradise that finds the synthetic David, played by Fassbender. Now, according to the playlist, we might have our biggest character twist that will tie directly to the original film, Ridley Scott created way back in 1979. So for that, we have to issue a spoiler alert. You've been warned. All right, according to the playlist sources, Captain Watterson's character will be playing Ellen Ripley's mother in Alien Covenant. The playlist, however, notes that since Covenant is an ensemble piece and Watterson isn't playing the lead role, the reveal of her being Ripley's mom could be just an Easter egg and not a major plot point. As of now, there is no confirmation from either the filmmakers nor the studio, so we'll have to wait and see what happens when Alien Covenant comes to theaters on August 4th, 2017. Dennis, what are your thoughts on Watterson possibly playing Ripley's mom in Alien Covenant? If the rumor is true, then I think it's lame. I, I think it's lame because why does it have to be connected to Ripley? So you're gonna say these, these crazy things happen in a different location, in a different time, to her mom, and then the same thing happened to her, and then we don't know what happens with her mom. Does she die? Is that why she doesn't know about it? Does she tell her daughter about these things? I really hope this is just something that's made up instead of something that's actually gonna happen. Uh, Perry, what do you think? I wasn't really surprised by the news. One, because Ridley Scott has teased that we're gonna learn more about Ripley in this movie. And also, because when we did the Collider news story on this image the other day, Mark Riley over there looked at that haircut and he's like, oh, is that a nod to Ripley? So the, the idea was kind of fresh in my mind, but I don't care if it's an Easter egg, I don't care if it's a big part of the story, I don't want this to happen at all, because I think this is the type of over explaining that could actually do a disservice, not only to this movie, but to the original movies too. You can't do that. Christian? Um, I would be totally cool with an Easter egg, uh, but not a main character. I think Easter egg could be a little fun. I think that it, depending on how they do it, if it's if it has an impact on the story, and like you're saying, if it's like, oh, well, it happened to my mom too, it happened to me too, then we get into silly territory. But I think an Easter egg, like, oh, like a kind of a nod, like almost what they did in how at the end of Field the Dreams, spoiler for Field the Dreams, um, is, is that the fact that it's his dad and it just kind of pops in there that it's his dad and you see a little thing of just knowing that her mom maybe that that's why she was how she was that's fine but as far as overall making the universe smaller and having to connect it by having her mom as the main character no please don't do that it, it really stinks yeah I, I just don't know why they have to do that why tie this we've already tied this into the alien franchise because you know I always thought it was a big mistake for them to call the last one Prometheus because I know a bunch of people who aren't like movie fans that were like oh this they had no clue whatsoever that this was tied to the Alien franchise. Now they've called it Alien Covenant. Great, right. you have that tie-in. You don't have to go further with the Ripley thing. And then why dress her up and make her mom look just just exactly like her? I just, I, it's, it's just too much. It's too on the nose. I just don't see how they're going to do it in a, in a natural way where it's not some cliche story type thing where, oh, Ripley happened to be the one. She happened to be in the right place in yeah. the right time because her mother went through this however many years before. It, it's not going to play well. Yeah. You wouldn't be okay with like a little, just like a quick Easter egg? See, I don't think it could be quick Easter egg or a big plot point. Either way, it 
it does that to the original movie. Even an Easter egg? I mean, Easter egg's almost like what they even did with uh, when they had in Man of Steel when you just see LexCorp on, on like a building or something. Yeah, but that's just Easter egg paves the way to the future installments too. So if they're dropping an Easter egg now, odds are we're going to hear more about it later and end up in the same situation. Sometimes. Or sometimes you could just have one that's kind of a nod for the fans. It's not always connecting to the story. I'd be okay with that if it's not a big plot point. I don't remember within the Alien franchise does Ripley talk about her mother a lot? No, but it would it certainly it kind of would go back to the relationship. You remember the, the relationship with the thing that happened with her daughter and, yeah. then, and then with Newt. So it would kind of explain a little bit more like but I just I just don't want We wanna, don't need that explanation. We don't though. we don't need the explanation of connecting it to aliens. You know, if, if there's something like very small and I'm not talking about I'm talking maybe two or two to five minutes tops of, of screen time to just say, oh, well, that's cool. That's a little bit of fan service. But even five minutes starting into dangerous territory. But I think two minutes, a little fun. Who was that? Blah, 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 Ripley. Oh, cool. We know that that was her mom. Peace out. Yeah, I'm just gonna, she's going to say something about her daughter and they're going to have like a scene. No, like I don't cut, want that. Cut to a baby or something that's like that. That's unnecessary. Yeah. That's unnecessary. All right, what's next? According to a report from Variety, Hunger Games director Francis Lawrence is in early discussions to helm the Battlestar Galactica reboot at Universal, with Westworld scribe Lisa Joy set to write. Brian Singer had been attached to direct, but has since moved on. This new version of the property at one point was said to not be related to the critically acclaimed series that aired on the Sci-Fi Network between 2003 and 2009. However, a report from The Wrap says the filmmakers are, in fact, taking into account the popular series, which made Time Magazine's list of the 100 best TV shows of all time. Whether that will be as a continuation of the series or a prequel or something else entirely it remains to be seen. No release date has been set. Christian, what do you think about Francis Lawrence helming a Battlestar Galactica movie? Well, as far as Francis Lawrence directing it, I think it's a good idea. I think that um, I think that he was the he kind of rescued the Hunger Games series for me because the first movie I, I was like I said I, I was a fan of the books and I did not like the first movie at all. I thought it was it just wasn't Gary Ross's version of it didn't work for me. And then I thought Lawrence picked it up really well. Catching Fire was a great addition to the movies. Now, Mockingjay Part 1, I actually dug, too, I think everybody can say was not good at all. Um, but I don't know if that was his fault because it was more about the material in the books. It pretty much followed the book. But as far as the director goes, I think he can bring that tone, the same kind of tone that he did with... Um, this Catching Fire or whatever the hell. What's the second one called? Catching Fire? Yeah, right? Catching, Catching Fire. fire. Catching Fire. Then. Brain fart. But Catching Fire, or that type of tone to a Battlestar Galactica works. What's more interesting to me is that they say that somehow they're going to try to relate it to a television series because they, I mean, if again, without spoiling Battlestar Galactica, how do you do that from the way that they ended it? Do you do it to where it kind of takes place in the middle of the series or do you do it where it takes place way after but then that gets really weird considering the way they wrapped it up it's interesting or does it just going to have that kind of tone so i don't know how they're going to do that but it but i think that they should go the tone of the battlestar galactica series because that's it was a complete shift from the kind of campy corn that the 70s yeah. Was. so yeah I, I like francis Lawrence do, doing it though I, i'm with you i mean i actually did like the first hunger games i did think it was uneven in and I think Catching Fire was the best Hunger Games movie, and I think Francis Lawrence did a good job with that. So I'm fine with him directing. I'm, I have mixed feelings about the yeah. movie version, though, because I was a big fan of the TV series. I think it's one of the best TV series of all time. It dealt with themes of war, terrorism, yep. survival. I don't know. Like like you said, I don't want to spoil it. There's just If you know what the ending is to that series, there's no way a, a movie can tie into it afterwards. They could do a prequel, but they already had two TV series prequels, Caprica and Blood and Chrome, that didn't work. If you do a, a spin-off or side thing for it, it actually takes away from what the actual TV series was, because how important in the context of that storyline, like it was like Captain Adama and uh, Starbuck and all that. And if you do something on the side that has different characters, I don't know how much weight that has to it. Perry? Get ready to watch Dennis freak out because I have not seen any Battlestar Galactica. Wow. You'd love but it. you know, that being said, on the one hand, this news makes me really excited because I've heard a lot that I would love the show. People have suggested that I watch the whole thing through, I mean, time and time again, and I keep meaning to do it and just haven't had the time. But this news makes me want to go back and watch it. But at the same time, I'm a bit of a completist, so I think it would upset me if I went back and watched it all and then this 
did there was a disconnect right. so i don't know enough about the show obviously to say whether or not they can continue on with a film but I just, I'm excited about this because it gives me a reason to go back and watch the show. As for Francis Lawrence, I'm not going to make this a Hunger Games debate, but we should talk about the first movie at some point because I have strong feelings about what Gary Ross did there. You like the first movie? I do. Yeah, I liked it a lot. And I liked his shooting style too. Oh my God. (laughs) Um, But Francis Lawrence, he directed the best Hunger Games movie. And I think all of his other movies are great too. I think he did a great job with um, I Am Legend. And even if you go to... uh, What's the Reese Witherspoon, Robertson, pa- Robert Pattinson one? Uh, uh, water for water elephants. for Elephants? Yeah, yeah uh, he even does a great job directing that kind of material. So I think as a director, I mean, he's a great get for this. All right, what's next? According to The Hollywood Reporter, Mel Gibson and his Braveheart writer, Randall Wallace, are working on a sequel to The Passion of the Christ in a story about the resurrection of Jesus. Wallace reluctantly confirmed the rumors that he has begun to write a script for a story about the resurrection, telling THR that the project was becoming too difficult to keep under wraps. Wallace said that he and Gibson began getting serious about a sequel while making Hacksaw Ridge, which Gibson directed and Wallace co-wrote. No studio or financial backing has been lined up for the Passion sequel at this time. Perry, do you think a Passion of the Christ sequel will even get off the ground? I'm actually kind of leaning towards yes, it's going to happen because Wallace is is so passionate about this project and Mel Gibson, I'm sure, is too. So I think if they keep pushing it, it could eventually happen. I'm just curious to see how it goes down if they actually get the go ahead to make this movie because the big thing about this is how much money it, it made and it was an independent film on a really low budget and you know, given the fact that this movie made an insane amount of money, are the studios now going to have the nerve to get behind something like this? Christian? I think it's going to get made. I When I Riley told me, I thought he was kind of kidding around. Yeah, like you know, a joke. He was like, oh, E.T. 4 is coming out. I'm like, what? <laughs> two, two, three. Go. Um, but then I was like, well, what's going to happen? Like, oh, the, the resurrection. But, like, but leading up to the resurrection, like afterwards, I mean, I guess he could do the lead up right afterwards. I have said it, and I've, I'll say it again. As far as Mel Gibson goes, you put all the crazy problems aside, and he's had many of them. And you are, and anyone who has strong opinions on him should have those strong opinions on him. The guy is a brilliant filmmaker, brilliant. Maybe I mean, Braveheart, Passion of the Christ, um, uh, the the shoot the last one that um, I can't even the, the one I can't even get it, the subtitle one. Help me. The Apocalypto. Sub- Thank you, Apocalypto, which is an, another incredible movie. Um, He's a great filmmaker. So if he wants to get this done and he and Randall Wallace are at pitch this take and they know, look, the thing is, he's got this stigma on him. He's got this thing on him that everyone, they don't really want to get in bed with Mel Gibson. Yeah. But like Perry said, if they start seeing the dollars and the ching to ching of seeing how much money the Passion of Christ did and, and they put that plan in front of them and go, this is what we can do again for pretty much the same money we did the first one for and people will go and they will see it and they will support it and they will support this story. Um, and I'm, especially because for the, for the demographic of what, of who Gibson will be going after as well, they're going to want to see this. And if they release it around Easter, also, another time, it will make a lot of money. So I definitely think it's going to happen. So don't you think, though, if they had said that they wanted to do this sequel back in the day before Mel Gibson's off-camera troubles, they would have greenlit this like that. They would have gave, given him the money, yeah. put a bunch of stuff into it. Now that it's so much later and he does have that stigma with him, it's a little harder to do. But I, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think someone will eventually pony up the money because I think there's money to be made in this. I don't think it's going to make the money the passion made. But it'll still make a decent chunk of change. It's going to make more than decent. It won't make yeah. as much as Faith the first one. Faith based movies are doing that. I can't remember any specific titles off the top of my head, but there's been a couple of them were low budget and yeah. they surprised everyone and they got pretty high spots at the box office. Yeah, and this is and this is someone who's coming off of making the first because going back to his filmmaking, so like regardless of what anyone here may may or may not think of Mel Gibson. If you watch The Passion of the Christ, it's a powerful film. It is a powerful film. It's hard to watch at times because, I mean, it's it's just a movie that you could tell he put, no pun intended, his passion into the film, and he's going to do it again, and it's going to it's going to be controversial just like the first one was, and it's also going to be like I said, it's going to go right into that Easter time, and in the faith based movie, it's going to make a lot of money. Sinead, did you see this movie, and what do you think about a potential sequel? Um, yeah, I saw The Passion of the Christ. Um, I definitely think a sequel is going to get made, absolutely. And maybe this is why it has taken so long for a sequel to get made, because I think that, like you said, Dennis, if 
he didn't have so many issues off screen, this would have been made a long time yeah. ago. But this movie did incredibly well. And whether or not you believe any of it, like this was a really good movie, like cinematically amazing. Like Christian said, really hard to watch at times, but I liked this movie. It was really, really good. So I definitely think it's going to it's going to happen. And I think that when you said faith based movies, it was there was one really recently. Yeah. I can't even think of it, but it was an indie film and people raved about it. Faith-based, faith-based movies are serious like yeah. contenders at the box office. And I definitely think it's going to be made. I think it's going to be good. And I think it's going to make a crap ton of money. Yeah. All right. Let's, before we get into buy or sell, let's check in with Wendy. What are people saying about our main topics? Well, for the Alien Covenant story, a lot of the chat saying that it's lame. Others are saying they don't believe in this rumor. DC Stranded says Fox needs to treat the AVP series like Disney treats Star Wars. Get your continuity together. And Niall Collins says it's fine as long as it makes sense. The Francis Lauren helming a Battlestar Galactica movie. Some of the chat are saying that they never really watched Battlestar Galactica, wow. Battlestar Galactica, but some that have says, uh, for example, Michael Branch, who says, I like the idea. Francis Lawrence is great. Keep uh, the production ground and practical. And finally, for the Passion of the Christ sequel, we are not at the buy or sell part of the show, but the chat is selling this, saying that a sequel is unnecessary. All right, thank you, Wendy. Now let's move on to buy or sell. Shania, what do we got first? One of Disney's most anticipated upcoming releases, Moana, has finally been given an official poster, with The Rock taking to his Twitter account to unveil the exclusive, also teasing that the trailer will debut via him, naturally, this coming Sunday. Moana tells the story of a brave teenage girl from 2,000 years ago who sets out on a voyage to prove that she is as capable as the explorers of old who sailed around the islands of Oceania as a master navigator and seafarers. The Rock will be voicing the demigod Maui who joins Moana on her quest out into the open ocean where she will surely meet a host of obstacles to overcome. Moana comes to theaters this November 23rd. Dennis, do you buy or sell the new poster for Moana? I buy it. The poster is fine. Uh, I'm buying it mainly because how the poster got debuted through The Rock's Twitter account. The Rock is just like, he's an empire unto himself. Yeah, he's yes. like, oh, Disney, don't worry about it. I got, I got this. this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just going to show the poster. Oh, by the way, when we debut the trailer, it's going to be on my Twitter account. <laughs> like, so that's what I buy. We talk about, we joke about how often The Rock is mentioned in the news. He's doing so much. I didn't even know he was doing this this animated film, but apparently he just doesn't sleep and has cloned himself five times. Perry, do you buy or sell this? He's a marketing department in and of himself. Um, I buy this. I dig the fact that it's a first poster and it has a teaser poster kind of feel. Nothing too spoilery. We get a sense of what the visuals are going to look like and the two main characters. And I'm just really excited about this movie because it's from the directors who did... Uh, a Little Mermaid, Aladdin, The Princess and the Frog. This thing has to be incredible. And I remember when um, we covered the D23 panel last year, Christina Radish wrote up a whole thing for Collider, and this was like the highlight of her report. She okay. said that this footage blew everything else away, and at the time there were other things that you know were highly anticipated Disney movies, but this, she said, I mean, I think she used the word dazzling, and looking at this poster, I can see a little bit of that. Christian? I buy it because I was at the D23 panel. Okay. I was there when they debuted this. And for the most part, f this particular year, the animation panel was it was just kind of trudging along. It wasn't as exciting as like the previous the two years beforehand when they had uh, Dina Mazel come out and sing Let It Go. It was, it was this big thing. And it was just kind of quiet. And then The Rock comes out. <laughs> and he starts talking about this movie. And he just electrified the crowd. I mean, he just got everyone excited and started talking about this movie and the characters and what it's going to be like. And then you see, after he kind of explained a little bit more of the story, what you see it in this poster, the adventure that these two are going to go on. And uh, yeah, I buy the poster because I felt th what, you, what your friend was saying too, is that it just had, it, 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 there was a lot to it. There's a lot of emotion. And from the, the team that put it together, this is going to be a very special movie. Um, so yeah, I definitely buy the images. And like, I buy The Rock being this, he's a company. He's a company all himself, like yeah. the marketing tool, and that's he's just doing so much, and he's able to do it. Like you said, he's cloned himself, but like I think that it's funny. Like Kimmel will go and debut trailers, and that's a television show. Yeah. Yes, it's Jimmy Kimmel, but it's a television show. This is The Rock's personal Twitter account yeah. and Instagram, like, and the people are just giving him trailers and stuff to put on there. Yeah, and it's Disney too. It's not like some small independent right. company. He's right. like, oh, Disney, I, 
I'll handle this. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, because they see the kind of reactions in the way that he what he's been doing. And I think that the person that should get this credit, the first person to really do this, was Vin Diesel. Mm -hmm. Vin mm -hmm. Diesel was the guy, like, I bet you that The Rock took a few pages out of Vin Diesel's book, because Vin Diesel was, like, the king of this stuff. Although it didn't work too well with him uh, on The Last Witch Hunter. He was promoting the crap yeah, out of that movie. Sure, and then not it, many people saw it. No, but it worked on other things, helping himself campaigning for roles and things. But he's, he's just been the guy that really has taken hold of social media and from working with The Rock on the mm -hmm. Fast and Furious movies, I'm, I'm sure The Rock probably, he's always been a student in learning. Yeah. I'm sure that the conversations in between, uh, The Rock's kind of taken that and just run with it. The Rock's yeah. also like a force of positivity. Yeah. Like when he's excited about something, that is infectious and it gets everyone excited for something he's doing. Yeah, and he's personally invested because he he's uh, half Samoan mm -hmm. and in this story, yep. I think, he takes talked place about in, the, that, yeah. in the Pacific Islander vibe to it and I'm sure a lot of the heritage and culture comes in I know this is super nerdy but that the little symbol on his on the little sail over there looks like the Dreamcast logo yeah. if you guys know what I'm talking about <laughs> all right what's next according to a new report from showbiz 411 Warner Brothers has recruited two more for its Ocean's 11 spinoff tapping Mindy Kaling and Helena Bonham Carter to join Sandra Bullock and Kate Blanchett in the heist film which is being directed by the Hunger Games Gary Ross Bullock is expected to be the Danny Ocean counterpart that's the lead role played by George Clooney in the 2001 film, while Blanchett will be the rusty figure played by Brad Pitt in the 2001 movie. There's no word yet on what parts Kaling and Bonham Carter will be filling. The site also confirms that Jennifer Lawrence, who was rumored for the project last month, will not be joining after all with the site giving scheduling conflicts, conflicts as the reason. Reports are now calling this Ocean's Eleven Ocean's Ocho, and that it'll be a spin-off rather than a reboot with Bullock's character believed to be Danny Ocean sister and the plot reportedly revolving around her plan to steal a necklace from the Met Ball to frame a crooked gallery owner. There were rumors that Clooney could cameo, strengthening the ties between the old trilogy and the new film, but as of now, it's unclear whether that will actually happen. Christian, do you buy or sell the new additions to Ocean's Eleven spinoff, Ocean's Ocho? The additions, yeah, I buy them because they're both they're they're both really good. They're they're, they're, they're talent. They're going to add the same type of elements that the other the Tony Shalhoub and those other people had kind of added to the star-studded cast of Ocean's Eleven uh, and Thirteen. Twelve was horrible, but what I'm really buying, and I when when they announced, the, the, and I still don't necessarily know if they need to make this movie, but what I will buy because when they I was going hard sell on this because I was like why don't they just give me either do one or two things you make your own heist movie with an all female team or make it a spin off don't make it a reboot we don't need a reboot and they're doing spin off now and possibly tying in to the franchise kind of what I was hoping Ghostbusters would do and they're doing that with this property so if this is done well and they can tie in. Uh, the George Clooney, they're going to have a lot of people that are going, oh, why do you have to do this? What The Ocean's 12 and 13, they told the story, it's done. Why do you need another one? Why do you have to spin it off? This is the way to do it if you because if, if you can do it, and Gary Ross is good for this movie. This is something that he will be, that will be a lot of fun for him to do. So I, and, and Sandra Bullock in the lead as George Clooney's sister, yeah, this is more intriguing to me to where I think it has potential to do something. I still, I'm not saying, oh, this is a movie I can't wait to see now, and if it stinks, I'm not going to be surprised, but I think this is the way and the direction to do it. I'm going to buy it as well, and I think adding uh, Mindy Kaling and Helen Bonham Carter, I, something like Schnepp would say is basically they're adding you know different flavor to it because if you're going to have a cast of eight in, in this movie, you want to have different, a diverse amount of people with ethnicities, ages, personalities, so that everything doesn't start the same. And then with Jennifer Lawrence leaving, I guess we don't, uh, we, were, we were wondering if she was going to be the Brad Pitt to the George Clooney, right. and then they, they, they uh, cast Kate Blanchett. So now we don't have to worry about that anymore. She's gone from the project. I, I didn't care either way. Mm -hmm. We were just wondering what role she would fill. Perry? In general, I'm buying this movie pretty much because of Gary Ross, because He's not the kind of director who will just do something to do it or to get a paycheck. He works yeah. really hard on everything. I had just spoken to him for Free State of Jones and the amount of research that went into that movie, obviously that's a very different type of movie, but he just like poured everything he had into that. And I have a feeling he would do the same here. But in terms of these two, I definitely buy them being cast. I was, that when I was on the show on Monday, I think that's when we talked about the last casting announcement, which was Cate Blanchett. Mm -hmm. And I had said that 
it'd be really interesting to see who joined next because if it was a Melissa McCarthy, it would completely switch my opinion of the movie, even though I do kind of like her. But like you said, the two of them bring a very different flavor to this. So I'm excited about that. Also, that report was just updated and apparently Elizabeth Banks could be in this now as well, mm-hmm. which th- that I'm not as high on as the two of them, but... That's the new update do to the story. Do you guys think she's fulfilling whatever role Jennifer Lawrence was going to do? And it then crossed my mind, yeah. Maybe. I just The thing is, I think Mindy Kaling will, will serve, again, the Tony Shalhoub. Tony Shalhoub was the, was the character in uh, Ocean's Eleven. I think he was the one that Which played one? the comedy. There was, it was just there was the comedic role. I mean, they all had bits of comedic role. Don Cheadle had some comedy, but there was the one that they relied on for the comic relief the most. And I think, and even, I guess Casey Affleck did too, but they all had comic <laughs> elements. But I think that Mindy Kaling can really serve that. Maybe. Maybe you can throw Elizabeth Banks in there who, because I think like what you're saying, if you throw Melissa McCarthy in there, then you start to shift the tone a lot more into the comedy because she can act. We saw her do that in St. Vincent, but she has been known more for her comedic mm-hmm. talent. So, but let's, let's get, and, and, and because what Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy have done in the past, maybe they'll just go back to their old, it'll be old hat and like start the doing, yeah, yeah. And they just did the other one together too. And they did it too. Didn't they just do two movies together? Uh, but they did two together, um, whatever the hell it was. But but I just don't know if I want to have that comedic shift as more uh, comedy elements. Are you referring to the Elliot Gould role? That's the yeah. That it, was the role that I thought uh, Carter would be good for. And then I was picturing Mindy Kaling because she, you know, a little more talkative. The two brothers, like if they paired her with someone really yeah, good, there Shalhoub, could be some good banter there. Yeah, I mean, Shalhoub, wasn't Shalhoub no. in Pain and Gain? Maybe you're thinking of that. No, I know the character I'm thinking of, and it's not Tony Shalhoub. And the and I think it's the Elliot Gould character. No. Yeah, he, well, no. he's like no, he's I'll like the him. money man and the talker, and no, it's not it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's that important. All right, right. let's move on to the next one. All right. At a recent panel at Wizard World Philadelphia, Tom Hiddleston was asked about reprising his role as Loki in Thor Ragnarok, which begins shooting in July and reuniting him with Chris Hemsworth as Thor and Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk. It will be the first time Hiddleston has played Loki since Thor The Dark World in 2012 and the fourth time he has played the character in the MCU. Via a report from comicbook.com, Hiddleston spoke about what he expected about the role in the second sequel to Thor, and also how he might still have a bone to pick with the Hulk based on the last time the two characters met back in the Avengers. Hiddleston, Hiddleston said, Let's not forget that it's no secret that the Hulk shows up in Ragnarok, and the last time Loki and Hulk were in the same room, it didn't go very well for Loki. So he's got a few chips on his shoulder, but it's fun, you'll see. We'll have to wait for round two for Loki and Hulk when Thor Ragnarok hits theaters on November 3rd, 2017. Perry, do you buy or sell the idea of a rematch between Loki and Hulk in Ragnarok? I definitely buy it because that was one of my favorite scenes with the two of them. However, I wish we weren't talking about it right now because one of the reasons that that scene played so well is because it kind of came out of nowhere and I didn't expect it to happen and that's why it was so hilarious. So, you know, a a piece like this where we know they're all involved in the movie, we're bound to talk about it eventually before the movie came out. But, I mean, the fact that it's this far out and that we're thinking about it already when it happens, I I don't know if they're going to go for a comedic tone again with it, but it's probably not going to be as fun as if I didn't know it was going to happen. Yeah. yeah I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it as well. I don't think they're going to, like you said, it was a surprise. It was one of the funniest and most iconic moments of the first Avengers. So they can't play it that way. Mm-hmm. I hope this time Loki fares better. Maybe he, he doesn't win a fight with the Hulk, but at least he does something. You maybe use some of his tricks on him. Um, I, I love the look on, look on Tom Hiddleston's face in the yeah. picture over there. He's just like, he, he's like. It's a rag doll. Yeah, he, just, yeah. he knows what's coming. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I absolutely buy it. I like the idea that we are going to see these two clash again. I agree with Perry that, you know, I would have probably preferred to just see it happen. I don't think it's going to be as much of a surprise as the first one was. Like, once you see them, they're probably going to play into a couple of jokes. I also don't, I kind of want Loki to start working with them a lot more. I don't want him to be, I think that we've already established that he's he's going to definitely do his tricks to kind of always get one up everybody, but he has also shown in the past that he's going to help his brother at times. So I, I kind of want to see more of that because I've already seen him as the villain. I kind of like when they team up. I do want to see him do his kind of scumbag things here and there. And maybe one of those things is kind of taking a couple shots at, at Hulk. But I like the idea that we're going to see them um, fight again. All right. All right, guys, before we get into box office predictions, let's check in with Wendy. What are the chat rooms saying about our buy or sells? 
Well, for the new poster for Moana, I'll see a lot of buy in this, and a lot of them already saying that they want to see this. Bless you. Um, <laughs> Danny Martin says the poster looks freaking cool, and Carlton Rudder says, I'm nervous about Moana. Could it be Disney's 2016 version of The Good Dinosaur? Moving on to Mindy Kaling and uh, Helena Bohm Carter joining Ocean's Ocean Ocho. Uh, seems like the chat is buying the actresses, but they're selling the spinoff. Kyle says, what even is this cast? I am strangely loving this. And finally, for the rematch between Loki and the Hulk in Ragnarok, the chat is totally buying this. Some in the chat do agree with Perry and Christian, saying this should have been kept under wraps. Miles Away Music says, I never thought I'd be so excited for a Thor and Hulk movie, but it sounds so dope. All right, thank you, Wendy. Now on to our weekly Friday segment, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is where we try and predict the top five movies of this weekend. Christian, what do you got? All right, so coming in at number one, I'm going to have The Conjuring 2. I think Conjuring 2 is going to come out. I think the, the sequel um, is getting some nice word of mouth. Obviously, the first one was a big hit with fans. Then coming in at number two is where I have Warcraft. I think Warcraft will come in at two. Number three, I believe Now You See Me 2 is going to come in. And then we finish up with four Ninja Turtles, five X-Men. Okay. Perry? Ooh. All right, so I am going with you, and I'm going to say The Conjuring is at number one. Not as big as the first one, but I think it'll be right behind it. For number two, I have Now You See Me Too, although I don't think there's going to be too much separating it between that and Warcraft. So Warcraft is going to be number three, and you know it's not going to do too well, but let's remember, it just broke box office records in China, so this movie is not going to have a problem, even if it does really poorly here. Four, I have Ninja Turtles. And then five, I'm actually going to go with Me Before You over X-Men Apocalypse. Okay, I have a similar one to you, but I have The Conjuring 2 at number one, but I have Warcraft at number two instead of Now You See Me 2, then Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and then Me Before You. What do you guys predict? Wait, wait what's, your, what's your list again? So you, where's Now Now You See Me? You don't uh, have it in there. Three. I have it three. three. So yeah. we, we have the same list? Uh, no, you had X Men at number five. Oh, I, have, I have uh, me before you oh, okay. at number okay. five. But what do you guys predict Conjuring Two is going to make? I have, I'd say forty five million this week. Oh, I think that's high. I think because okay. the first one I believe made forty one, so I'm going to put it between thirty five and forty. So you think the sequel is going to do less yes. than the original? Yeah. I'm going to say forty six. Okay. Yeah, I think it's going to go high. All right. Um, <laughs> just a reminder: we have our Warcraft spoilers. Yeah. review that we just posted this morning we have the conjuring non-spoilers up already and then we're going to do the conjuring spoilers one with our collider nightmares team that's also coming up yeah and we interviewed the um the hayes brothers last night for who wrote the conjuring two on schmoes and it, we josh mccuga who was scared out of his mind with these stories we sat him right in between the two of them and they told the stories like all the research they did with the warrens and some of their stories were like freaking me out but Makuga couldn't handle it, so if you want to check that out, it's yeah, so I saw the fun. pictures on Instagram. Just his face, he, like he's trying to cover his face. He was so he, he does not do well with that stuff, and like they were telling the stories, like they told about it, like they went to go see an actual exorcism, um, and they told the whole entire story, and Makuga like tried to get up a couple times, and it was it was pretty funny. And then Perry, you and Riley interviewed them for we Collider did. Nightmares. After they finished up with Schmoes, we spoke to them for just the Collider Video YouTube channel and for Nightmares as well. And those guys got stories for days. Yep. And I could have listened to them talk and tell them forever. I mean, at this point, I'm. this is probably a bad thing to say. I almost want to experience. I, I just want to see. I want to see one of these things. Happen. I see Riley shaking his head at me. <laughs> they, they, put, like, they talked about an audio file about where they actually listened to one of the exorcisms from the 70s. They talked about it, and, and I can't remember what website just put that up. The actual audio file, if you want to hear it, it's up. I didn't I do want to hear it. I know, oh. not, yeah, you can find it, but I'm not pushing play. It's yeah, like a yeah, thing yeah. where I'm afraid to say the demon's name out loud for mm -hmm. fear of conjuring him. My name is Andy Signor. <laughs> See what happens? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, now we're moving on Mailbag. This is where we answer your viewers' submitted questions. All you have to do is email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. Sinead, what do we got up first? Jason Dolan writes, Dear Clyder, love the show. The shit rats, the spilled nachos, MOVA's eyebrows, all of it. <laughs> My question regards the girth of releases every year. With so many movies that come out, it's easy to let one slip through the cracks. 
Last night, I saw the trailer for Margaret, starring Anna Paquin, Matt Damon, and Mark Ruffalo, and I totally missed that movie when it was released. It felt like I was in an alternate universe. Is there a movie you completely missed and years later saw the trailer and were like, when did that come out? What movie did you miss on its initial release, probably before you started being the sports center for movies, that really surprised you when you finally saw the trailer? Thanks, and sweat away. Well, I have a couple examples, but they don't exactly fit what he's talking about where I saw a trailer years later. The first one, um, it was a movie that hadn't come out yet, but I, I went on vacation two years ago, and when I came back, there was all these TV spots for John Wick. And I was like, what is it? And it's like, it's opening this weekend. I'm like, I have heard nothing about this movie. Right. I didn't know Keanu Reeves was having a movie. I'd never heard of John Wick, and all of a sudden this movie was coming out. The other one actually has to do with Schmodown. When I went on uh, with, with John Schnepp as a tag team, and then one of the questions was, what is a romantic comedy with Kate Winslet and Cameron Diaz? And I was like, what the hell is this? And usually, you know, when we get a question like that, when we get the answer, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember that. When you guys told me it was The Holiday. I love that movie. That's a and great like, movie. It has like Jude Law and, mm -hmm. and Jack Black. Still, <laughs> I have no clue right. what that movie, I have no memory of the trailers, the posters of it ever existing. And so I looked it up later and I was like, this totally was off my radar. What about you? I tried to interpret the question both ways. And first, for one that I wasn't really aware of until I saw a trailer, and I was like, whoa, I need to see that. It was probably Nightcrawler because I wasn't really following that. It's kind of hard to miss anything when you're sitting online looking for news all day, but I wasn't really following that film. And then all of a sudden, we got that trailer with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal talking into the camera, saying, like trying to convince uh, people to give him a job. And that was very, very striking. And that was at the top of my list then for that year. One movie that I missed and then from positive word of mouth had to go back and see was Paddington. I don't know yeah. if you guys all saw Paddington, but don't roll your eyes at that CG bear doing like silly childish things. That is one of the most heartwarming movies I've seen. And I can't, it, it came out in January, so I can kind of understand why people overlooked it because that is considered a dumping ground, but that movie was absolutely delightful and I wish it did better. Yeah, it was a movie where I didn't like any of the trailers. I've been known to say that any of these kind of live action animals with people freak me out, like <laughs> chipmunks and all the Smurfs and all that crap, Garfield. And, and I thought the same thing of that. And then when I actually saw it, I actually really, really enjoyed it. Christian? This is a movie that I had no idea even existed. My wife watched it, was watching it the other day, and it had Alicia Vikander and Kit Harrington in it. And it was uh, a testament of youth. Um, and it, For a minute, I thought you were going to say, uh, what's the one with Jeff Bridges and Julianne Moore? Because they were both in that together. Like Seven Sons? Yeah. Oh, Seven Sons. oh I, saw that, I saw that they in are, the theater. They are actually in that together, but no, Testament no, of Youth te is great. Uh, yes, yeah, I had never, never even heard of this movie, and I love both Alicia Vikander and Kit Harrington, and, and plus the fact that it's a true story. And I, was, I just thought, I was like, oh, this is going to be terrible. I don't even know what the hell this thing is. And it wasn't. It was a really good movie. It was an inspiring story. It was a tragic story. And the, it also gave Kit Harrington a role that I think that he's been underused in movies. So you talk about Seventh Son. He was in that. He should have been the lead. Yeah, he was um, way he, better he than the other been guy. He should have been the lead. He was, he was the one in the beginning of the movie. You're like, okay, great. It's going to be, oh, it's not going to be about him. And then it's about Prince Caspian. Um, so th this, I think that um, this is a movie that if you haven't seen and you just want to see really good performances, and it also, I bet you, it's, it was instrumental in Alicia Vikander getting some more roles because she it, it was really an undervalued performance. Everyone's out everyone is like out of this world in that movie. Yeah. She's incredible She's though, great. just because of what that and character yeah. goes through. It's not an easy role to have played. Right. And Taron Egerton's in the movie yeah. too. She plays his brother. And have you ever heard of it? No. Him? Yeah. No. See, I never even heard of the movie and I didn't know what it was. And and my wife stumbled upon it watching it. And I'm like, wow, this is a really good movie. Now, Kit Harrington was in a movie I wish I hadn't heard of, Pompeii. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sinead, Sinead, is there any movies that, that kind of flew under your radar that you later discovered? Um, well, I remember talking about the Aloha casting controversy mm -hmm. on Movie Talk, and then I just kind of like forgot about the movie after that, didn't really see any trailers, and then maybe like just a couple months ago, um, I was looking for a movie with my family, and we saw it on demand, and I was like, I vaguely remember something about this movie. I couldn't remember what it was. So we watched it, and I mean, it was lame. It's not a good movie, but um, but yeah, I just I just kind of forgot about it, and obviously there was so much talk about it. So I was like, oh yeah, of course. 
But that's pretty much it. It's kind of it's kind of hard to miss movies these days. Huh? Yeah. That's another movie I wish I had not known about. <laughs> right. Well. Yeah. All right. What's next? Brian Knight writes Collider Movie Talk. You have pointed out how many anticipated movies become just average because of a weak act three. Would you rather watch a movie with a great act one and two, but a weak act three, or a weak act one, but gets better with a strong act two and act three? Definitely something that finishes stronger, because yeah. it's just something that it leaves an impression. You, you're more forgiving if a movie has a great ending. You're more forgiving of a slow or weak beginning and middle if it ends strong, where the other way around just doesn't work. It just you could have a great beginning and then if it ends poorly you're like that's eh, i didn't like it so what do you think i totally agree with you if you start off and the movie's like eh, i'm not really digging this too much and then the second act picks up you're like okay you got me you hooked me in the third act delivers strong I'm like okay fine at first i wasn't into it but now after two and three i'm leaving the theater going okay that was a solid film the opposite of that is if I'm really hooked in, a, in the first act and I'm like, okay, what's going to happen next? And the second act is really good. I'm like, and then the third act just falls. I'm leaving disappointed as opposed to just being mildly disappointed as it starts. But then you hit me at the end. Kind of happened with X-Men Apocalypse. It was like For crazy. a lot of people, for me, for <laughs> yeah. me, it didn't. But For me, people, I felt yeah. like Most the people. beginning was Most strong people. and the middle was pretty yeah. good. And then the ending kind of fell apart. Yeah, I've thought myself in circles with this question because initially I would think, yeah, a movie that finishes strong would make the bigger impression and would make me think about it more highly later on. But then at the same time you have, like for example, because Now You See Me Too is coming out, the first one, I was, I'm not saying the first one's a great movie in the beginning, but I was digging it for the most part. And then that ending, I mean, it just completely ruined it for me. I had no interest in seeing that story continue. And I didn't see Now You See Me Too because of it. But then again, I'm thinking about uh, Our Brand is Crisis is another good example. That, which nobody really saw. But that movie was really, really solid for the first two acts, better than anyone would have expected. And then the third act was terrible. Mm. But at the same time, I kind of forgave it because I thought the beginning was good enough. It's like the the uh, film school quote. You can be in film school for like a day and someone says to you, if you have a problem with your, th your uh, third act, it's probably a problem in your first or your second act, you know? It's yeah. just all so interconnected. I feel like even if a third act is bad if I'm that connected to a story and characters earlier on I might be more forgiving so I think I'm going to lean towards that you know where I find the opposite though is in te <laughs> in television because television there's a lot of series where like they have really good beginnings or middles and then the endings aren't as good I mean we mentioned Battlestar Galacta I actually didn't think it was that strong of an ending no. for the series yeah but because the series was so great but we're talking about something that lasts, you know, over 10, 20 hours versus a two hour, two hour piece. Um, so something that just Mark Riley just let me know that the chat's also talking about the fact that John Williams is confirming that he's scoring Ready Player One uh, and Indy 5 and wow. wants to score episode eight. So Indy 5 also, I think that um, Scott Mance, our buddy, was talking to Spielberg. And mm -hmm. I think Spielberg kind of gave that to him. I don't know if he gave it to him before anybody else, but I'm pretty sure he did. But that came out yesterday. But now the fact that he is doing Ready Player One and he is doing uh, wants to do Episode Eight. If he wants to do Episode Eight, he's going to do it. So John Williams found a cloning machine just like The Rock yeah. as yeah. well. Right? So he do all these movies. Seriously, they should make a movie together. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for a mailbag. Uh, I just want to remind you that we're going to take your live Twitter questions. You can tweet us at Collider Video, and Sinead will pick out a few. What do we got up first? At the Creech Creed tweets, any possibility for a video game news show since video games are the biggest thing on YouTube right now? Um, it's not. It's something that we've talked about, but we definitely have other shows in the works first. We have some things in the queue. It's something we may visit later down the line, but it's it's not in our priority list. Any, any thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, cool. <laughs> no, would you guys want to see a video game show here? I think a video game show here would is something that eventually will happen. Yeah. Now, whether or not that's it's in two months or a year, I think it's something we you and I have definitely talked about yes. it, and it's something that definitely makes sense. And we also like every one of our shows where you put a, a Perry Nimeroff and a Clark Wolf on on Nightmares yeah. because those are your horror aficionados. That's who you want to put on the video games. Uh, which, no. we, which right now, to be honest, none of us 
are hardcore gamers. Yes, we, I like playing video games, right. but I would never be like, okay, I know everything about what's going on. In and video we would games. never put somebody you know that isn't really in the thick of it on the show. So it's not that we can't find. We we certainly know circles that can find those people, but we just like Dennis said, the priorities right now are shifting towards one particular thing, and then we'll get to the next. And I think it'll happen though eventually. Okay. All right. What's next? At Narc89 says, are animated film directors barred from a Best Director nomination? Is live action a requirement? No. No. If you direct an animated film, you can be nominated yeah. for Best Director yeah. overall. Well, it just it just doesn't happen very often. Right. Like Pete Docter was considered for Inside Out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just didn't happen. Yeah. At Mr. J Ninja tweets, what is the first and last movie you saw at the drive-in? Oh. I don't think I've ever been to a drive-in. I, I don't think not. I have either. Yeah. So it goes when you live in New York. I was. It was when it was a re-release, but it was Return of the Jedi for sure. That might have been the last one. A uh, long, long time ago. What we do hear a lot in LA is we go to outdoor screenings. You know, not necessarily drive-ins. Like over here, I know it sounds strange, but they have it at the the cemetery, the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. They show the movies there all through the summer. So I've seen a bunch of movies there. Like I saw Get Carter. The player, um, oh God, what, what's the name of that one? Oh, Singing in the Rain, a, a bunch of different things. Clearly that needs to be the top thing on my to-do list. Oh, here. you have not How done have that I yet. not done that? Have you heard of it? Yeah, I've heard okay, of it, but I, I've yet okay. to go. They are screening uh, Jurassic Park this weekend somewhere. I forget what park, but they're doing it outside somewhere here, and I, I kind of want to go. I would say though, don't go to one of those screenings to a movie you haven't seen before. It's, right. it's not a yeah. good experience because people are talking and chatting. But if it's a movie you've already seen before and you don't have to follow exactly, it, it is perfectly fine. Um, I just have to give props to Ed M. who writes, please create a two-hour daily show dedicated to the 90s hit Get a Life. Thanks. <laughs> so the Chris Elliott one? <laughs> Such a random, random comment. Thank you for that. It really made me chuckle. All right. <laughs> All right, Ryan Permison tweets, has this year been underwhelming for movies or have our expectations stopped us from enjoying them? No, I don't think so. No. I think it's been underwhelming. Really? Yeah. For you? I do. This summer, this summer's been underwhelming. Um, I don't think our expectations are, are high. I think that just been, there's not been a lot of great movies. There's been some. I mean, I know you loved Green Room. Civil War certainly was really good. Uh, Jungle Book was good. There have been some good ones, but... I don't know. I felt I was talking to Ellis about this the other day. I felt like this summer so far has been underwhelming. And I think that it's also where we talked about. I don't know if we were talking about it on the air mm -hmm. or if we were just behind the set. It kind of blends into each other. But we were talking about how this it's not superhero fatigue as much as it's like the spacing of the movies. We have Batman v Superman, Deadpool, Civil War, X-Men Apocalypse all on top of one yeah, another. Yeah, they should have spread them out more. Should absolutely spread them out. That was that's one thing. And then the other movies that have followed haven't been good. like I really didn't like Now You See Me Too. Um, Teenage, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was an abomination. Like there's all these movies that are coming out that it's just like ah ah there's nothing that I've I don't know. I felt like there was more last year and I think we'll get more quality like always once we hit like the end of September into December, but it's been an underwhelming I guess summer. We're only in the middle of June, True. though. There's still a lot of big things it's to come early. out, so hopefully something will meet expectations. Mm, but I don't think this year in particular is any lesser than last year. I mean, every single yeah. year we go through a thing where, you know, a couple bad ones come out and we're like, oh, is this a bad year? Like, no, there's still good ones in there. I know, Perry, for you, uh, a, a movie that comes out on my birthday, Independence Day oh Resur my God. Resurrection. Yeah. That's going to change your whole year around, right? Dear God, I hope so. If I don't show up to work the next day after seeing that movie, yeah. I'm not in a good place. Yeah. What's next? Sean B. tweets, since Marvel will be at this year's San Diego Comic-Con, does that mean that Disney will be there as well? Not necessarily. I mean, last year Disney was there for Star Wars, but Marvel was not there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that one or the other is going to be there. Uh, Disney's going to be there, I think, this year. I think it doesn't necessarily mean that, mm -hmm. but I think that they're, they're going to be there because I, next year they're not going to be there. And they have a lot of stuff that they want to promote. And D23 is not this year. So you have Star Wars Celebration is going to get a lot of the top Star Wars stories the week before. But you also have a lot of stuff. It, obviously, with the Marvel movies, they're going to have their panel. But Beauty and the Beast will show their stuff. They're going to have some more announcements. I think whether it's Maleficent 2 or whatever it might be, there's going to be more things. that they, They're working on so many different movies and so many different properties. They want to get the word out at a big convention this year, and they don't have one to do it until next year where you're definitely not going to get a Disney presence, but they'll be there this year. I hope they don't keep splitting up everything at 
away from Comic-Con. Like to me, Comic-Con was always the one place where you can get a little something from every studio and everyone was celebrating everything. And now it just seems like so-and-so is pulling out. Disney's doing its own thing. So I, I hope we don't get too out of control with that because otherwise San Diego Comic-Con won't be the same great thing anymore. It's a lot of studios are pulling out Ugh, though. And, and I think me. I'm a, the Disney portion of it though, I get. I get them pulling out of it because they're going to do their own uh, con. They're going to they can they can do it. They can if they combine. They did like a, the Marvel and Star Wars, and they did a Disney con with all that stuff. And D twenty three became yearly with everything that they did. Yeah, I just don't like it for the fans. It, I, yeah, I, I don't like. I, it. Yeah. No I one, agree. No fan, uh, not no fan, but not every fan can afford to go to all these different conventions. They can't go to WonderCon. New York Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con. San Diego uh, is D23 expensive in and of itself. Celebration. But their, their argument to that would, oh, I assume, would be, well, not everybody can afford to see Civil War or Batman v Superman or this. This is our, if we're going to put on something. You can choose whether or not you want to come to it. This is what we're going to do. Maybe they put it at a place that's big, one of the biggest criticisms of Comic Con: not enough room um, that you can't get. Well, tickets. that's a legitimate criticism. It is that, so that maybe, they need to fix. So maybe Disney is is wants to just it's it's in the business of competition. So if they want to build out. Out something bigger that gives the fans more and maybe that's what they want to do maybe that they're also fed up maybe there's not enough bang for their buck for what the money that they're spending that they can promote their own properties so they're, they're saying they want to give the fans more with the amount of property so I get the move I also understand that certain fans they're, they're gonna have to pick and choose yeah I, just I don't think, think putting them a week before is a smart idea no though. no <laughs> not at all um, this year though I definitely makes sense for Marvel to be there Doctor Strange it's a not as well-known property so to push that to to that audience yeah. I think makes sense all right what's next a clay tweets Zootopia cracked a billion thoughts on this pleasant surprise yeah it was a movie that I actually wasn't too fond of the trailers uh, but when I saw it I was actually really surprised and I think a lot of these animated movies especially when they're good they just had the, the the legs on these things they just keep going and going and going and and yeah I think it, it quietly passed one billion dollars oh I'm thrilled about it that movie was a, a pretty pleasant surprise for me too and I, I saw it twice already I love the thing so clearly that's that's part of the reason because movies like that when they're good too they have the rewatchability quality and think about how many not necessarily kid friendly but animated movies have come out since so I'm sure there's tons of kids out there that went to see it multiple times my daughter being one of them it's yeah. definitely one of those movies that is outside of what I was talking about as far as being underwhelming it's one of the standouts of the year for sure and it, it was just done well it felt that it fit that Disney tone it had some great characters to it it had rewatchability for families and kids like I wind up seeing it two times in the theater with my, my daughter and my wife wound up seeing it another time with her as well she saw it three times and she has the blu-ray so it's uh uh, yeah, it's one of those movies that just stuck. I'm glad that it did as well as it did because it's a good movie. All right. Let's do two more. LV426 tweets, what's the latest on the Tintin movies? Are they still happening? Is Peter Jackson still recovering from The Hobbit fail? Uh, well, I mean, The Hobbit didn't fail. It just, I think, for the fans, including myself, was was underwhelming. We were expecting, I was expecting Lord of the Rings quality, and we got something a little lesser. Um, as far as those movies are concerned, I don't know. The whole idea was supposed to be that what Spielberg directed the first one, and then Jackson was supposed to direct the second one. Andy and, Serkis was doing. Yeah, they're supposed to do like yeah. rotate directors on that. I remember Tintin did okay at the box office. I don't think it made like a ton of money, so I think that held it back. I guess I don't think it had much of a lasting impression too. Like, did anyone really say after they saw that movie, "I want more Tintin"? Me, really? I loved Tintin. I thought Tintin was great and a super underrated movie, but it didn't have a I'm in the minority of people who said that and I I enjoyed it I loved that movie I don't know if I loved it but you know I what I thought it, it was uh. it was like a, a Indiana Jones for kids yes yeah, yeah so. and that's why I loved it it felt like that and it felt like and I think I said it in my review that it was the best Indiana Jones we had since the last crusade and it was it it felt that way Andy Serkis lends that brilliant performance capture once again inside of this movie I think it's an underrated movie and I don't think we're gonna two or three because it just didn't have the reception for the amount of money that it costs to make those movies. All right. All right, before we get to the last question, I want to remind you guys that actually today after this show, we are going to do our Facebook Live Q&A. Mm -hmm. you go, all you got to do is go to Facebook.com, find the Collider, uh, what is that called? Verified page or whatever, fan page. Yeah. Like it, check it out. We're going to post, we're going to go on there probably five minutes after the show ends. We'll answer questions for about 10, 12 minutes and all four of us will, will be there. Um, all right, what's the last question? Um, all right, let's see here. Hold on one second, I'm sorry, I lost it. 
here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Luis E. De La Pena. Is there any superstar you'd like to see in a Star Wars film? I would love to see DiCaprio or Jolie. This Jolie, isn't a superstar, Jolie. but I really wanted Tatiana Maslany to be in a Star Wars mm. movie. She was in the in the running or rumored to be in the running when... Um, Rogue One. Yeah, yeah, when the Rogue One casting uh, stuff came out. And I am a huge, huge, huge Orphan Black fan. She is fantastic on that show. And even though she's done some other movies other beyond Orphan Black, she has not had the opportunity to show the greater world what she's really capable of. So I think when she does get that opportunity, it's going to blow your mind. I think you're going to be happy because I think she's going to get cast in a Star Wars film. They're very high on her over there. There's been so, we talked about it on Jedi Council many times. She's always in the rumor. She was rumored like in those lists of people that they want to be in a Star Wars movie, so I think that will happen for sure. As and Gina Rodriguez is another one that's going to pop up in a Star Wars movie. Um, for me, in a Star Wars movie, see, DiCaprio, I, I go back and forth because it's funny. He's one of those actors that, I, well, initially when you remember, he was rumored for Anakin Skywalker, and now I think he would over Hayden Christensen would have been great. But it, like, there's something about this back then. Not everybody was into it because yeah. it's you see him, it's just Leonardo DiCaprio. It's Leo from Titanic. Yeah, and it's gonna. You're gonna. I think what Star Wars has done well is is cast these actors in the role that you just forget who they are, and they become you know the, the character. So Daisy Ridley is who was she? You know, John Boyega. One or two movies beforehand, you saw them as Finn. You saw them as Ray. Um, I actually, even though bigger star, Tom Hardy is somebody that I think. Or Tom Hardy or um, Rooney Mara are two that I would really like to see in a Star Wars film. Both big names, both that I think more so Tom Hardy than Rooney Mara has to get away from, oh, that's Tom Hardy, but I think you can do it. Um, and I want to see him play an evil Sith Lord for sure. Uh, not Also not a big superstar, and I mentioned this on a mailbag before, Dane DeHaan. Mm -hmm. I think he would be a good fit into that, playing a, a young Jedi or maybe even someone on the dark side. Um, but he's in that Luc Besson sci-fi movie. Valer Valerian? It's, with it's the, based on that French uh, comic book, I think. With Cara, Cara Delevingne. Yeah, yeah. Delevingne. So I wonder how that's going to turn out for him. All right. Uh, before we go, we also want to remind you that we have the Schmodown today at 2 p.m. with the big battle between Christian Harlaw yep. and Andy Signore <laughs> of Screen Junkies. Uh, Christian, yeah. are, you, are you pumped and excited <laughs> to take down... Uh, Andy Signor. Yeah, look, this is this has been. Uh, someone tweeted this morning. It feels like a heavyweight pay per view fight at this point because everyone is talking about. I mean, I, the 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 amount of fans and support, for Collider fans, Pro fans. Thank you. Uh, I am looking forward to doing this. I think the time for talking smack is done. It's time to just go in there to let him run the yap trap. I'm just going to go in there. I'm going to stay silent. I'm going to do my thing. I'm, I, like I said, not underestimating the guy. He definitely knows his stuff, but I'm looking to put up a pretty good fight. All right. All right, guys. I want to thank everyone at the panel with us today. Christian, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at Christian Harloff, both Twitter and Instagram, and I will send the electrical tape that is run over Andy's mouth. <laughs> Perry, where can people find you? You guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. I am on Collider Nightmares, which you should go check out every Tuesday, and then we have Best of the Week here every Saturday. And Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so um, on TV Talk on Mondays here at Collider, um, Movie Talk on Fridays, and then on Mailbag over the weekends. And you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. I'm also on uh, Movie Talks Monday and Friday. Also on some of the spoiler reviews, mailbag over the weekend. And also, we're, reminder, the Facebook Live Q&A right after this show. We'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.